me to be able to introduce, to open this session. Uh, but be assured, the subsequent talks would certainly be much more interesting. Uh, we are now just going through a few of those principles that are behind our possibility to remove CO2 from the blood. Um, starting with physiology, of course, uh, we know respiratory failure uh, very well. It's a problem that we deal daily in the ICU. Respiratory failure comes in two flavors, uh, an increase in the alveolar arterial gradient uh, or a decrease in, in uh, alveolar ventilation. The first may mainly lead to hypoxia, while the second may mainly lead to hypercapnia. But of course, they don't come uh, as completely separate entities. They, of course, go hand in hand. <clears throat> so, as a response to hypoxia and hypercapnia, our body would first increase respiratory drive. This would lead to an increase in work of breathing. And as long as we are able to compensate for this increased work of breathing, we will also uh, compensate hypoxia and hypercapnia. There will be a point when uh, the respiratory failure progresses, where we would not be able anymore to, to actually do this work of breathing. And that's the point where hypoxia or hypercapnia would manifest. And that's also the first point where we see uh, this problem our patient has in the blood gas analysis. Of course, clinically, we would see it much earlier. So this is a very important point uh, to emphasize the clinical picture of the patient. What do we do? Usually in the ICU, we intubate the patient in this stage, we apply positive pressure ventilation, and we take over the work of breathing from the patient by the respirator. This, of course, comes at a cost, and this is what we have seen very well in the COVID epidemic, COVID pandemic, um, that we are very uh, at high risk, depending on the lungs condition, of inducing ventilator-induced lung injury which could lead to multi-organ failure. Um, this especially if the hypercapnia, the hypercapnic respiratory failure uh, progresses uh, during this time. But this idea that we should ventilate, intubate and sedate the patients, this idea is somehow in our heads, um, but it's not, I think, a given. And there is someone else in this room that also thought so uh, already in the 70s. Um, Luciani Gattinoni, he um, tried already in the 70s in his uh, animal experiments to remove CO2 from the blood at a low flow rate. And the conclusion was that technically the extracorporeal CO2 removal is a relatively simple procedure. But of course, the development of this basic research to devices that are usable and that have a good risk-benefit ratio uh, for use in our patients uh, has been a long way, but we have uh, come this way, as we will see. So why is it really possible to use a very small, a very low blood flow rate to extract a meaningful amount of CO2 from the blood? It's in principle, it's very simple. If you look at the uh, diagram where you have the O2 and CO2 partial pressures on the x-axis and the content in the blood, the actual content on the y-axis. You see this uh, dissociation curve for oxygen that we very well know of the hemoglobin, uh, but for CO2 the story is a very different one. So you see that here, for a given change in partial pressure of CO2, the change in content is much larger than this is for oxygen. And this is due to very complex uh, storage mechanisms of CO2 and bicarbonate, mainly in the red blood cells. And because those gases equilibrate fast across a membrane such as our lung or an artificial membrane, because of that fact, it follows that effective CO2 removal is possible with much lower flow rates than it's necessary for oxygenation because from a given volume of blood we can extract a lot of CO2 and add only a little bit of oxygen. 
So this is the physics that supports uh, our procedure, our intention to remove CO2 from the blood extracorporeally. Now, the technical aspects of the machines that already Luciano Gattinoni used for this purpose and that we have our, at our disposal uh, right now. Um, there are a few considerations, technical considerations that we should know. Um, and basically, those are the three properties that we care about. Of course, it's the CO2 removal that the device is made for. Then there are uh, transmembrane pressures that are built up while we are running the device. And there is, of course, coagulatory activation across the surface of the membrane and the tubing in the device. And the balance between those effects, the positive effects and the side effects, if, if you want, of this device, uh, they depend on some choices that can be made in the technical uh, properties of these devices. So basically, sweep gas flow that's the airflow going through the membrane, the blood flow going through the membrane, and the membrane surface area are the main determinants that will increase CO2 removal. But at the same time, an increased blood flow would, in theory, increase the pressure gradient across the membrane, decrease coagulatory activation because there is less contact time, and the opposite would be true for membrane surface area. And there is quite a large amount of good basic data, research data, that supports uh, these physical principles. So, of course, up to blood flow of one to two liters, there is an increase in CO2 elimination uh, across the, the membrane, and also, of course, an increase in transmembrane pressure. This has been shown uh, very nicely. Same is true for membrane surface area. A larger surface area leads to a higher CO2 elimination has been shown uh, for membrane surface areas up to and above 1.3 square meters. And of course, it also decreases the transmembrane pressure. So this is well known, this works. The coagulatory activation, something that if you have used uh, this kind of device, you have probably already seen uh, in your patients, but it can be counteracted with developments in the material mainly and in the geometric configuration of the membrane and the tubing. And this is a comparison uh, that we made in Zurich of a old generation and a new generation of one device to remove CO2 from the blood. And we see quite well that the runtime of individual membrane systems, which of course depends on coagulatory activation, uh, is much improved in the new generation as compared to the old generation. So if we really can remove CO2 with this low blood flow rate, then of course we have the huge advantage that we are minimally invasive with vascular access. The hagen poiseuille relationship will show that for blood flow rates that here lie around 0.5 uh, liters per minute, we have the choice to go very low with catheter sizes. So in our practice, practice, a 13 French double lumen catheter, the same that we use for CRRT, is very well suited for extracorporeal CO2 removal. So in the end, balancing those uh, properties, the membrane surface area, the blood flow, there will probably be a sweet spot and that will be a sweet spot where we cannot remove 100% of the CO2 that's produced in the body, but the amount needed to reach our goal. And also here uh, is another example of a generation change in the membrane technology that increased the CO2 removal by 45% in this case. So the technological prerequisites, I would say, that are necessary to use this method are now in place. This is uh, the cohort from Zurich. It's basically one, a larger single center cohort, cohort of about 70 patients. It just shows how quickly the CO2 normalizes in hypercapnic respiratory failure here in intubated patients uh, that uh, when, when this device is used one hour after baseline, we have a normalization of pH and uh, pCO2. And also there is in the end uh, decrease in mechanical stress to the lung in the ventilator settings that we need to use.
So low flow extracorporeal CO2 removal in, in uh, conclusion, it will uh, allow low invasive uh, removal of CO2. It will allow coupling with CRRT. There is a sweet spot um, where the technical and the physiological limits flow, membrane, su membrane surface area, efficiency and potential adverse reactions might be um, optimal. And this is supported by recent data that I've shown. So in, in the end, when we do the math, we will be able to remove about 50% of the VCO2, of the CO2 produced by the body, using such a device that runs at about 500 milliliters uh, per minute of blood flow. And in practice, uh, these are a few examples of devices that are available to do this. Uh, they differ, if you look closely, a little bit in those properties. So they don't use all the same uh, uh, balance between surface area, material choice, uh, tubing choice, but uh, they are balanced so that individually they will reach their goal. And the, the ones that are based on the CRT platforms, the newer entries in the field, of course, allow uh, the serial use of CRT and ECHOR in one catheter, in one vascular access, uh, which is, of course, a compelling option. So we do have now this possibility to go back to our patient with respiratory failure that we have intubated um, that we make the lung uh, take over this increased mechanical stress to counteract hypercapnic mechanical failure. And then, of course, we can inc induce uh, ECHOR, extracorporeal CO2 removal, and decrease the amount of work that we have to do with the respirator and decrease the risk of ventilator-induced lung injury. Going back one step, if you remember, the patient developed hypercapnic respiratory failure when breathing spontaneously. And I hinted at this, of course, we could at this point induce ECHOR and recompensate this patient's ability to uh, do the work of breathing that is needed because we take over 50% of the VCO2 in this patient by ECHOR. And this leads to different concepts where ECHOR could be used. This is a small introduction. Of course, it will go into more detail in the following talks. So in short, we could use ECHOR in patients that are spontaneously breathing to avoid intubation. That could be mainly the case in COPD patients. Whereas in ARDS patients, we could reduce the tidal volume that's applied to a lung with much reduced compliance even more than we usually would according to the ARDSnet guidelines. On the other hand, we could have a less proactive, a more rescue strategy in both scenarios. In the COPD, COPD patients, it would mean when they have to be intubated to enable rapid weaning using ECHOR. And in the ARDS patients, it would mean to enable lung protective ventilation according to the current guidelines in, uh, in spite of a worsening of compliance uh, and, and lung status. In ARDS, of course, patients are, have very different physiology than in COPD, and these concepts need to take this into account. And one thing I would like to mention, of course, is the J-receptor mediated risks in the ARDS that increase the work of breathing that the patient will automatically do. So here, a uh, sedation would be necessary to prevent, uh, prevent self-inflicted lung injury, whereas in COPD, the focus could be on a proactive approach to uh, avoid intubation using ECHOR. So I'm looking forward uh, to the next talks to see this in detail. As a conclusion, the amount of CO2, as you have seen, that can be removed from a given volume of blood is much larger than the amount of O2 that can be added. So low blood flow rates between 350 and 500 milliliters per minute are sufficient to remove about 50% of a typical VCO2, as we have seen. We can cross a standard double lumen CRT catheter 
then reduce the components of pulmonary energy load, or we could reduce work of breathing necessary for this patient. And we can do this in series with uh, CRRT and have control over both components of acidosis, the respiratory and the metabolic acidosis. Thank you for your attention. Um, Hello. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that very clear explanation. Are there any um, questions from the audience? Otherwise, maybe. <clears throat> well, once again, thank you so much for your really nice uh, physiological explanation. I mean, you concentrated quite a lot on the effect on the lungs, you know, lung protective ventilation, low tidal volumes, or uh, sort of uh, avoidance of intubation. Uh, what do you think, is there any role for looking at the hemodynamic side, you know, the right ventricle pulmonary potential in these patients and maybe having a more hemodynamic um, targeted role for ECO2R? I know that we are outside clinical trials, but from a physiological perspective. It's a very good point. And of course, it's not as, uh, not as often the case in the patients to have these types of problems, pulmonary hypertension, et cetera, than uh, lung failure. But in the patients that are uh, concerned with pulmonary hypertension or right heart failure, this is a very important point. We all know how important the PCO2 is uh, in these patients and how uh, we get into a uh, vicious circle when trying to reduce the CO2 with increased respiratory pressures um, or tolerate the higher CO2, both of which is bad for the right ventricle. So in the end, this is an excellent uh, scenario where uh, we could use ECHOR. Uh, there are other considerations, um, for example, the permissive hypercapnia. It's very unclear how much of the permissive hypercapnia is really something we want to tolerate because there are positive and negative effects associated with it and the data is not very clear. So it could be, um, individually in some patients, it could be beneficial to reduce the amount of hypercapnia that we must tolerate to protect the lung using ECHOR. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Hilti. So, uh, <laughs> key, key of course to implementing any technology in the ICU is proper patient selection and we have Dr. Golliger from Toronto to talk about that. Great, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hilti. I'm going to continue the physiology-oriented discussion, but uh, to turn uh, the perspective a little bit, to focus a little bit more on the physiology of and, and how that varies between patients and how that might help us to select the right patient for this intervention. Uh, these are my disclosures. So the problem, of course, as we all know, is that our patients vary widely in their response to all the different treatments that we try. And uh, that's represented here by this, uh, symbolically by this uh, graphic where you've got some patients in green who, uh, when you apply an intervention, they'll benefit, and some patients in red who maybe are, who don't benefit or even harmed. And then the outcome that you want to observe to prove that the intervention is beneficial ends up getting washed out because of, the, uh, because of this heterogeneity among the patients. Um, and we think that one way of dealing with this heterogeneity is by looking at the physiological response or responsiveness of the intervention. And of course, the physiology matters, not always, but particularly when it reflects the mechanisms that are driving outcome in, uh, in mechanically ventilated patients. And one important determinant of outcome that uh, Professor Hilty already alluded to is the risk of ventilator-induced lung injury. And we think that a primary physiological determinant of ventilator-induced lung injury is the driving pressure. So it makes sense to want to select patients for ECOR who are going to have the greatest reductions in driving pressure. This is how we might decide which patients are going to benefit more or less. And the question becomes, can we predict who's going to have a large reduction in driving pressure before we, we actually put them on ECOR? So, uh, you've already been introduced to the technology. The, the, the concept is, is relatively simple. The idea is that you cannulate uh, a vein, um, and because you're using relatively low flows, you don't need that large of a cannula. So this uh, kind of uh, extracorporeal intervention would be more like dialysis and less like ECMO. That's the hope and the goal. 
with a goal of reducing complications, making it easier to apply in, in centers that don't have um, existing ECMO experience and expertise. And of course, the goal of the intervention is really, like Professor Hilty said, to reduce the stress and strain applied to the lung, the minute volume, the tidal volume, the driving pressure, and the mechanical power. But ECOR is not a benign intervention. So, the, you know, it's easy to turn a knob on a ventilator. It's very different to put a relatively large cannula in somebody's veins, anticoagulate them, and run their uh, blood through a washing machine equivalent. Um, where you're going to activate coagulation and cause hemolysis. This is a very invasive intervention that is associated with significant risk and significant cost. And so unless a patient is going to accrue a substantial benefit, it's hard to see how the, 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 the benefit of the intervention could outweigh the risk. And so among a popula po population of patients who vary in their response to therapy, some patients will have a, a large uh, benefit, and hence that will outweigh the risks, but others may have a relatively small benefit, and the risks then will outweigh the benefit. And so patient selection really becomes crucial to proving benefit for this intervention. So the question is, how do we do that? Can we predict who's going to have a large driving pressure response to uh, the application of extraportal CO2 removal? And uh, a few years ago, uh, Art Slutsky, Marcelo Amato, and I undertook uh, a theoretical exercise. This is as close as I'll ever get to theoretical physiology, but it's really actually pretty basic. The idea is that you take kind of first principles, the alveolar ventilation equation, and through a series of, of algebraic rearrangements, you can arrive at this relationship, which defines the relationship between the application of ECOR, the re which is basically CO2 clearance as represented by device performance. The, um, uh, so this term here represents device performance or CO2 removal. And then a series of patient characteristics, specifically the static compliance and the alveolar dead space fraction. And these factors basically modify how much a given level of CO2 removal translates into driving pressure reduction. And this is just theory, but it's uh, well-grounded theory because the physiology here is, is pretty well understood. So let me explain just briefly the, the kind of physiological basis for thinking that compliance and dead space matter. Well, first of all, a compliance or its, its inverse elastins basically reflect the size of the baby lung available for ventilation. So consider patient A on the right here, where you're reducing tidal volume from six to three. Well, the, here the, extra, the end expiratory lung volume is relatively large. So the reduction, the reduction in strain resulting from the reduction in tidal volume is relatively small in comparison to patient B where the end expiratory lung volume is relatively small. So the dynamic strain here is relatively higher and you achieve a larger reduction in dynamic strain. And this is really a function of the size of the baby lung, which is really what compliance or elastins uh, reflect when we measure them at the bedside. So that, that makes sense as to why a patient with a smaller baby lung would have more benefit from tidal volume reduction achieved by the application of ECOR. Um, there's even some data showing that um, in previous lower versus high tidal volume trials, the elastins really predicts who's going to benefit and who's not going to benefit. So this is a reanalysis of, of the several low, lower versus higher tidal volume ventilation trials that we published a couple of years ago. The patients who were randomized to low tidal volume are shown here in the, on the blue curve or high tidal volume shown here on the blue curve and patients randomized to low tidal volume shown here on the red curve. And what you can see is um, across all these patients where you have a baseline measure of elastins here, the patients with low elastins, there's really no difference between lower versus higher tidal volume. And you have a large mortality difference uh, be between patients uh, when elastins is high. So this suggests really that elastins is predicting the mortality benefit of lowering tidal volume. And this of course, reinforces the emphasis on the driving pressure, but also uh, reinforces the idea that we can use this simple physiological parameter as a tool for patient selection when trying to do ultra-protective ventilation and lowering the tidal volume even further. The physiological basis for dead space fraction is uh, slightly more complicated, but still, I think, relatively basic. If you imagine that you have a lung with a given dead space represented here by VD, and VCO2 is entering, entering the lung, well, uh, the portion of the lung that clears 
uh, the VCO2 is, is the non-dead space lung, so you have a, a, a given tidal volume being generated here. If you have a lung with a higher dead space, now you have to have a, a, a higher tidal volume to clear the same VCO2 because more of the lung is not participating in ventilation. And if I then increase the VCO2, well, that's going to increase the tidal volume, of course, in both cases, but it's going to increase the tidal volume substantially more in the lung that's less efficient because I need more tidal volume to compensate for the increase in VCO2. And really what ECOR does is exactly the opposite. You can flip the direction of the arrows here. You have, uh, you're reducing VCO2, and so in a lung with less dead space, you have some reduction in tidal volume, but in a lung with more dead space, you have a greater reduction in tidal volume. So the dead space, again, is determining the effect of ECOR on the tidal volume. So that's the physiological basis. Is there any data to suggest that this is actually um, real and not, just, uh, and not just theory? Well, this observation here comes from uh, the a reanalysis of the supernova trial, which was a pilot trial of, of an ultra-protective ECOR-facilitated ventilation strategy. And what you, can see, what you can see here is that we found that the reduction in tidal volume following the application of ECORD was directly correlated to the estimated alveolar dead space fraction. So the physiology seems to play out very nicely. And again, as a consequence of that, the, tidal volume, the driving pressure is also uh, correlated to uh, the estimated alveolar dead space fraction. So patients with higher dead space are accruing greater physiological benefit from the application of this low flow ECORD. Does, uh, what does this data show about uh, the Im impact of elastins? Well, first of all, as you'd expect, um, the compliance didn't modify the effect of ECOR on tidal volume. That's not what the relationships imply. But what we did find, as expected, was that the lower the compliance, the greater the reduction in driving pressure whenever ECOR was applied. So these observations bear out this uh, emerging theoretical framework for selecting patients based on their physiological characteristics. But of course, we don't want to just know what happens to the physiology when we apply this intervention. We want to know what does it do to outcome. And uh, probably the most important randomized trial of evaluating the effect of low flow ECOR on mortality in, in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure published to date is the REST trial uh, by Danny McCauley's group. And they randomized patients to an ECOR facilitated strategy of four mils per kilo versus a conventional ventilation strategy of six mils per kilo, and they found no significant difference in uh, in in uh, survival over uh, over 90 days, and uh, this was quite a disappointing result, um, but potentially reflects this challenge of heterogeneity of treatment effect. But it's possible that some patients are being harmed while others are being benefited. And so we had the opportunity to dig into these data to try to analyze this. So this these figures here, which uh, I'm showing probably for the, for the first time in public, um, and this has been accepted uh, for publication, should be out soon, uh, shows the, if the relationship between the patient's ventilatory ratio, which is a surrogate for their dead space, and the effect of, uh, of low flow ECOR on mortality. So I realize I don't have a legend here, but the, or I do actually. So the, the blue line represents the standard care arm the red line represents the intervention, and you'll see among patients who have a relatively low ventilatory ratio at baseline, the, the, um, the, the risk of death is actually sub substantially higher with intervention. Whereas in patients with a uh, high ventilatory ratio and high uh, uh, dead space fraction, you can see that the, now the risk of death is lower with intervention than with standard of care. So we're really seeing here a marked heterogeneity of treatment effect determined by and predicted by ventilatory ratio. Another way of, of looking at the same uh, information is the figure on the right where you see the predicted probability of harm uh, with the intervention is very, very high when ventilatory ratio is low and the predicted probability of benefit becomes high as ventilatory ratio increases. So this gives us some guidance as to how we might go about selecting patients for the next trial. Really suggests we should be focusing on patients with high dead space as reflected by high ventilatory ratio. The, uh, this, these here are the results for elastance, and I have to say these results were somewhat surprising and disappointing. Um, the, uh, what, we, what we find here is that, first of all, the relationship, uh, the moderating effect of elastance was not very strong. The probability of interaction was, was only 68%. But if anything, uh, 
At low elastins, there's really no difference in outcome, but at high elastins, there's this trend towards harm from the intervention, which is pretty much exactly the opposite of what we might have predicted. And again, the figure on the right uh, reflects that a, a fairly high probability of harm uh, among patients with higher elastins. So this is uh, a, a disturbing. So to try and understand this, we, we dug into the data a bit more and conducted uh, some mediation analyses to try and tease out different effects. So this is a bit of a complicated plot, and I, um, I, I won't spend too much time on it. But the point, what we're representing here is uh, the effect uh, of intervention on outcome mediated by the driving pressure at lower elastins and higher elastins and then the remainder of the treatment effect of intervention on outcome apart from its effect on driving pressure at lower elastins and at higher elastins. And if I could represent these results graphically, what they show is that at low elastins, there is a small benefit of ECOR on mortality through the driving pressure pathway. And similarly, a small benefit seen uh, through the, through the uh, alternative or what's called the direct pathway. So, uh, both, um, both through both pathways, there's a there's a, a small associated benefit, although the the benefit's so small that it's uh, you know not a high probability of benefit. But at high elastins, what's really quite striking is, as predicted, the effect on driving through driving pressure was actually larger. This is really what we're predicting: higher elastins. But the in the direct pathway, this alternative pathway, the pathway apart from the mediating effect of driving pressure there's actually significant harm associated with the intervention. So possibly what we're seeing here are the effects of anticoagulation or other injurious effects of the device and why this would be larger in a patient with high elastins versus lower, I'm not sure. Although, for example, in the recent anticoagulation trial, we observed much greater harm from anticoagulation in patients with COVID pneumonia when they had severe disease uh, compared with moderate. So there may be some, some influence of severity of lung injury on the effect of anticoagulation. This is just me speculating here. But the point is, is this is complicated, and this is why we need to do trials to test our physiological paradigms. Quite interestingly, there was uh, a marked influence of the baseline severity of hypoxemia, and it was patients with moderate hypoxemia where a lot of the benefit of uh, the intervention on outcome was seen. So when the, when the PF ratio was above 110, the mortality with intervention was lower than with usual care. So this, again, may be a moderator of, of outcome and why. This is the case, not entirely clear, but possibly patients with more severe hypoxemia are patients who need ECMO rather than ECOR. And uh, so we need to incorporate that into our trial design. So this, this approach, the low flow um, uh, facilitated ultra protective ventilation is gonna be tested in an upcoming uh, trial uh, out of Canada, the ultimate trial uh, led by Neil Ferguson and Eddie Fan, where they're gonna be testing this approach on the practical platform trial. And the population that they're prioritizing are patients with primarily with moderate degrees of hypoxemia with the goal of uh, who have uh, higher elastins at baseline because we're not totally uh, ready to give up on the theory that elastins predicts benefit. And uh, they'll be applying ultra-protective ventilation using ECLS. But based on the preliminary data with, um, in the supernova trial that Professor Hilty already alluded to, we'll be using a relatively high flow intervention because of concerns about the risks of low flow from this intervention. So those results are uh, awaited. So to wrap up, I think there's pretty compelling evidence that the balance of risk and benefit of this intervention both from a physiological standpoint and from an outcome standpoint depends on the, the patient's physiological characteristics, namely their ventilatory ratio, their elastins, and possibly severity of hypoxemia. And this all just reinforces that careful patient selection for upcoming clinical trials is absolutely gonna be crucial uh, to see this intervention successfully tested and implemented to uh, benefit uh, our patients. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ewan. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Maybe I can. Yeah. Yin, thank you so much for your talk and obviously very interesting analysis of the REST trial. I, I was really struck by your uh, uh, um, analysis of the intervention based on the ventilatory ratio and your uh, crossing point is a really high uh, 
ventilatory ratio of above three. So, I mean, two questions related. One is, how many patients do you think would be eligible if you were to apply that, uh, that you could identify with a ventilatory ratio above three, which might imply a the space above 70, 75%. And the other thing was the interaction with the hypoxemia, which goes the other way around, I was, I was expecting. So might be difficult questions to answer without further analysis, but I'd be really interested in your, in your views on that. Yes, so these are, these are really, really thoughtful points. With respect to the valentory ratio, you're right, that, that's a, fair, a fairly high threshold of three. A, a relatively small fraction of the population, about 20%, had a value above that. So you're looking at a relatively small fraction. But I think the critical uh, issue is that threshold for benefit would probably be modulated or even lowered if you're using a higher flow system where you can achieve greater CO2 removal. There's, you know, the original paradigm stipulates this interaction between how much CO2 you can remove and how much uh, uh, dead space there is. So probably if you have a more efficient or physiologically effective system, that balance might be a bit lower. And so of course, it, you know, it, I think this is probably, we need to think carefully about uh, the design of the next trial. And the ultimate trial, I think, will be an opportunity to see if, if that kind of subgroup effect persists. As for the surprising influence of hypoxemia, I think that needs to be replicated because it's certainly not exactly what we predicted either. I thought hypoxemia would be irrelevant. Um, but if anything, I, as I suggested, maybe those more severely hypoxemic patients are patients who look more like those enrolled in Eolia and would benefit more from a, a more aggressive ECMO intervention. So, thanks. Well, thank you very much indeed. And, um, and it is my pleasure to Welcome to the podium, Professor Alain Combs, who's going from Paris. He's going to give us a talk on uh, Ecotois for moderate to severe ARDS. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Luigi, Danny. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today to uh, also discuss a bit further the results we got uh, in uh, recent years uh, about uh, Ecotois for severe ARDS. This is my disclosure slide. So uh, we have heard a lot about the rational, and the rational is clearly to decrease the intensity of mechanical ventilation in these patients by decreasing the tidal volume, the plateau uh, pressure, the driving pressure, maybe also the respiratory rate, all together focusing on a decrease in ventilatory lung injury, induced lung injury, uh, which is a mix of volutrauma, barotrauma, atelectrauma is the closing and opening of the uh, LVLI, uh, during tidal ventilation and uh, also biotrauma, the cytokines which may be produced within the lungs and which spill over into the circulation uh, in uh, uh, patients with severe ARDS just because of the vent and not only because of the disease. And uh, okay, we have a lot of papers published uh, over the last uh, <clears throat> few years, including this one, uh, which showed that, uh, excuse me, uh, among all the factors, and especially uh, when looking at uh, the PEEP and the plateau pressure and the driving pressure, it appears that it was mostly the driving pressure, uh, which was uh, significantly uh, associated with mortality, with a threshold probably around 15 of driving pressure, above which the mortality exponentially uh, increases. And uh, this has been also demonstrated on the large uh, lung safe database using the same threshold, once again showing that there was a significant difference in terms of mortality. So they may, there may be room here uh, for defining a population of patients who might benefit a lot uh, from uh, this strategy. Also very interesting data uh, gathered uh, during the lung safe uh, uh, cohort uh, and targeting here the respiratory rate. It was very interesting to uh, notice that uh, the respiratory rate was among the factors significantly associated with mortality independently of all other factors. And look here, the mortality increases by 3% per additional breath uh, movement per minute. It's probably above a threshold, let's say maybe 25, 26, above which this becomes significant. And it's written in guidelines. We may increase the respiratory rate up to 35 uh, if needed. So there may be a price to pay. And uh, there's very interesting data. This uh, uh, animal model here uh, in peaks, uh, where the peaks were ventilated using the uh, so-called the ideas net strategy, the only difference between the two groups were that uh, in uh, a second group of pigs, uh, the respiratory rate was decreased uh, from 
uh, 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 30 down to 14, uh, as you can see here. And uh, of course, if you do that, you will artificially induce uh, a respiratory acidosis. So you need some kind of uh, way here uh, to remove the CO2 and was performed by an echo device here to provide the same uh, CO2 removal what was combined between the event and uh, the echo device in pigs for, for whom the uh, 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 respiratory rate was decreased. So it's uh, just primarily data. Uh, it's an animal model here, but there was less pro-inflammatory cytokines within a couple hours in the lungs uh, using the uh, uh, measurements of uh, some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, in the BIL fluids and also uh, in uh, the blood uh, of these uh, animals. So this concept may also be integrated in the concept of mechanical power. The formula here is a bit complex, uh, but it involves uh, mostly the driving pressure, the PEEP, uh, and the PEEP, which is a static component, which may be not that important here, and, and the respiratory rate. And uh, we have data also suggesting that there may be some kind of threshold here. It's in joules per minute. And when looking at the mechanical power above which also mortality uh, significantly uh, increases. And those are uh, ECMO data. Uh, it's a cohort of patients we gathered a couple of years ago about uh, the uh, vent setting just before ECMO. Uh, and you can see here that the uh, 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 mechanical power was way above the threshold, which is once again around 18 here, uh, was between 20 uh, and 25 uh, just before ECMO. And with ECMO, it was possible also to decrease intensity of mechanical ventilation, both targeting lower tidal volume uh, and lower uh, respiratory rate. This might just be the same uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, ECHO and uh, the uh, decrease in the intensity of mechanical ventilation uh, with uh, ECHO. And, uh, there was a, a, a further analysis uh, also uh, of those parameters here uh, showing that uh, this may be a mix of the delta P, the driving pressure and the respiratory rate, which were most predictive here uh, of the uh, increase in mortality. And the simple formula uh, combining for uh, delta P plus the respiratory rate might be uh, here uh, the most informative, uh, uh, at least as informative as mechanical power in predicting mortality and may become uh, also a, a target uh, for a future trial here, uh, targeting here uh, um, reduction of the intensity of mechanical ventilation loaded by the echo device. So this is the paradigm here. We have uh, the uh, so-called uh, protective ERDS net strategy may actually not protect uh, uh, every patient here from uh, severe ventilator induced lung injury, an ECHOR, which is sometimes called uh, CO2 dialysis, may make it possible uh, to reach those targets here uh, of uh, uh, less uh, uh, aggressive mechanical ventilation, uh, maybe targeting the driving pressure and also the, uh, the respiratory rate. So, you have seen those uh, uh, data. I will show you also uh, most of the slides you have uh, already seen. This is the uh, older now uh, extra van study, which tested uh, with the uh, uh, Novalung uh, AV shunt uh, a strategy of decreasing uh, the tidal volume uh, from uh, six down to three ml per kilo predicted body weight here. Uh, and uh, there were 40 patients randomized to these strategies, 39 here. Uh, to uh, uh, the uh, classical ARDS net strategy. And actually, this study uh, of, uh, was a, a, a failure as uh, uh, the uh, uh, primary endpoint is concerned. There was no difference in uh, the number of uh, ventilator free days uh, at day 28 uh, and day 60. Post hoc analysis showed there may have been a benefit for those patients with a PF ratio uh, below uh, 150. So uh, this might be also indi indication for the, for the future. We, uh, uh, as the uh, ESICM trials group and the ECMONET, supervised the uh, Supernova uh, pilot trial, uh, which was uh, published uh, 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 four years ago now, and uh, testing two uh, high flow devices and uh, lower flow devices, uh, and applying a strategy of decreasing the tidal volume from six down to four, uh, targeting a lower pr uh, plateau pressure, uh, let's say 2830 down to uh, 23.25, and uh, adjusting the PEEP to keep the same mean airway pressure. So altogether, there was a small increase in PEEP, a significant decrease in the PEEP lights, so we ended up with a significant decrease uh, in the driving pressure. Uh, 
uh, from 13 uh, down to 9, uh, less than 10, actually, in these patients. And uh, PaCO2 and the pH were controlled uh, in these patients uh, by uh, the uh, ECOR uh, device. So uh, there was a lot of uh, secondary uh, analysis of uh, this uh, uh, supernova cohort, and uh, we showed that it was probably with the higher flow devices that uh, the probability of reaching the target was uh, at the highest. And also, uh, and this may be actually uh, important here, it was only with the uh, higher flow devices was possible here uh, to decrease the respiratory rate uh, and to decrease here uh, uh, the uh, 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 and not to have a, a decrease in the pH uh, is, uh, uh, was actually a normalization in the pH uh, with these uh, higher flow uh, devices. Uh, there were some uh, adverse events which obviously should be uh, taken into account uh, because those devices for now uh, need full anticoagulation, which may lead to uh, severe uh, uh, adverse hemorrhagic complications. Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, the rate of complications was uh, different between the two types of devices uh, and actually was um, higher, the rate was higher for the uh, lower uh, flow uh, devices. So we concluded that at least was reasonably safe uh, and feasible and uh, uh, precision medicine uh, uh, was applied also to this database and um, most of the slides I have here uh, are only shown by uh, Ewan a couple minutes ago showing that uh, alveolar dead space and static compliance uh, were uh, uh, the uh, greatest predictor determinants of the change, uh, the change in the driving pressure, uh, which was uh, alluded by the uh, echo device, and uh, uh, it was uh, even more uh, uh, important in those patients with the uh, highest uh, baseline uh, dead space uh, fraction. Uh, and uh, it was also demonstrated that some strategy using these parameters might allow uh, researchers and networks to uh, uh, enrich their study and uh, uh, being able to uh, uh, screen less patients and enroll less patients to, uh, to reach uh, the uh, uh, conclusion here. And of course, we have now uh, the big uh, REST study, which is the largest uh, trial of ECOR uh, performed so far. Uh, it was not only for uh, ARDS patients, it was only, uh, also patients with acute uh, uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure. It was scheduled to enroll 1,100 patients uh, with a primary endpoint of 90-day mortality. And as you know, uh, the study uh, was uh, uh, stopped uh, early uh, both for uh, uh, signal of harm and also for futility uh, after uh, 412 patients were uh, enrolled. So it's now very important to uh, have a look closely at those uh, results. And uh, Ewan showed you uh, the uh, secondary analysis, which is very important and should be uh, now taken into account for future trials. But let's have a look at the population of patients who were enrolled in that trial. So uh, it was quite sick population of patients here. Uh, the PF was uh, around 115, 118. Uh, in both groups. So it's uh, uh, moderate, but uh, on the low side uh, regarding the PF, prone positioning here uh, was applied to only 11% of those patients. So uh, as the standard of care uh, should have been probably over 80% uh, 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 now, uh, the uh, uh, ARDS uh, diagnosis was confirmed uh, in 60% uh, of the patients. And the PIP is also on the lower side here. And maybe it's here uh, that we have to have a close look at the uh, rate of patients with uh, uh, driving pressure above 15, which is believed to be uh, the threshold of uh, importance was uh, only 50% of, of the patients uh, in the uh, REST uh, trial. And of course, uh, the REST uh, was uh, a negative study uh, as uh, uh, the primary endpoint uh, was concerned here is no difference in uh, uh, the uh, mortality rates between the two groups. Uh, there was uh, more uh, ventilator free days uh, for the uh, control group as compared to the ventilation, uh, uh, the echo facilitated ventilation. And uh, the need for ECMO also, there was not significance here, but tended to be higher uh, in the uh, echo group. So, it's clearly a negative theory, maybe a, a signal for harm. And actually, the signal for harm uh, was uh, clear uh, regarding uh, brain hemorrhage, uh, which was uh, significantly uh, higher uh, in uh, uh, the uh, echo group and leading uh, also to uh, uh, the uh, stopping of, uh, of the study. So obviously, this study has some limitation, but it's the largest uh, performed as of now. 
And uh, when looking also uh, at uh, uh, the uh, treatment uh, effect, uh, which was applied to the patient, the uh, tidal uh, reduction was a little bit modest. Uh, uh, it was uh, six at baseline, was a little bit uh, uh, less than uh, five here uh, in uh, ECOR uh, patient. Uh, and also a modest uh, decrease here uh, in uh, the uh, driving pressure. And at the same time, uh, there was a higher respiratory rate uh, in uh, the echo group, uh, maybe because the device was not uh, enough uh, to fully control uh, the VCO2 uh, and the CO2 elimination in these patients. And once again, the rate of prone positioning, uh, taking in account the severity of these patients at baseline, uh, was probably lower than uh, expected. Uh, and looking at the uh, other limitation of that study, uh, there's only 6% of the screen patients which were actually included. And that's probably uh, this one, which is uh, the most con of concern here. Uh, most of the sites were naive, and this is an invasive strategy, and probably uh, there is a need also for some experience with uh, uh, this device. So what's next? Uh, we have to work, uh, for sure. Uh, there will be more uh, investigations with uh, new uh, uh, devices like uh, we are conducting in France right, right now with the uh, uh, Prisma Long Plus. And of course, we need to repeat uh, the uh, big RCTs, uh, the supernova uh, second step, the phase three uh, uh, studies, which uh, should be uh, also conducted next. And uh, what might be the better uh, uh, selection criteria strategy uh, for uh, uh, ventilation in these patients, this uh, remain to be determined. So uh, in conclusion, uh, ECOR uh, might be called respiratory dialysis and uh, it might be easier than uh, ECMO, uh, but still uh, there might be uh, also uh, more complication actually than in ECMO patients because of the very high need for anticoagulation for now uh, in these patients. Uh, the rational, the physiological rational is here uh, for sure. Uh, but for sure, uh, once again, because the, before the large diffusion of this technology, uh, we should test, retest uh, the concept uh, in, uh, in larger trials. Thank you so much for listening. Um, th thank you very much, Alan. Um, so any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Yes, thank you for this uh, interesting talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the anticoagulation uh, you used. You uh, have mainly uh, uh, adverse events in, uh, regarding bleeding. So what anticoagulation did you use? What were the targets? And could there be a role for uh, citrate uh, anticoagulation? It's two very important questions here. First, citrate for now uh, is limited to uh, uh, extracorporeal blood flows of uh, less than 200 ml per minute. And uh, those new generation ECOR devices, uh, the, the low flow devices, uh, which are running on a, a CRT platform, usually to reach some significant ECOR, uh, you need to reach at least 300, 350, 400 ml per minute. So at that level of blood flow, this is not possible to use citrate. Uh, so you still stick with the uh, regular classical uh, heparin and fraction apparent strategy, and you need full anticoagulation in these patients. Otherwise, the device will, will clot. Those membranes are large membranes. It's close to ECMO membrane, uh, one, 1 1.5, sometimes a bit bigger uh, in, in square meter, the size of the membrane. So if you do not anticoagulate the patient, the membrane clots within minutes. This is the major limitation for now uh, of low flow devices. Uh, together with uh, some hemolysis also, which has been demonstrated, uh, if you are using ECMO pumps, centrifugal pumps, running at lower blood flows. Uh, ECMO pumps are made to uh, 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 propel the blood at three, uh, over, above three liters per minute. And if you use that pump at one, 1.5 liters per minute, there might be also some hemolysis. Those are the problems uh, of those small machines for now. Okay, um, I'll ask a question. So, so ECMO we use in the sickest of the sick patients and the evidence base is relatively good. Um, here we're, ta we're suggesting taking patients with mild to moderate ARDS who generally do pretty well under ventilation and giving them a therapy that either show no benefit or actual harm. So do you think we should be using this outside of controlled trials right now? <laughs> 
though it's a major point here. It should not be outside, at least registries, in which you collect uh, outcome of the patient's complications, and of course, uh, if possible, RCTs. Uh, but for RCTs, we clearly need to define the population of interest. Should we target the baseline uh, driving pressure? Should it be a mix of the compliance, the driving, uh, the respiratory rate? I, I, I don't know. So these are uh, the uh, next steps for this technology. But for, for, for now, we have sufficient data uh, to warn uh, our uh, colleagues, uh, ICU physicians, not to use this technology outside, once again, at least registries data. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for a, an excellent talk. So our next speaker is Dr. Marco Ranieri, who will speak about the combination of CRT with extracorporeal CO2 removal in ARDS. Thank you very much. And I would like to start this presentation discussing with you the concept of lung kidney crosstalk that may take place in critically ill patients. This is a concept that was developed by Claudio Ronco and a number of years ago. And here you have the example of the possible influence of acute kidney injury to the lung through the spread out of mediators through the hemodynamic effect. And on the other hand, you can see here the effect of acute lung injury direct acute lung injury or mediated by ventilator-induced lung injury on the kidney function. And there are a number of evidence supporting this concept. This is a study that exactly shows what I was mentioning before, the possible effect of acute kidney injury on the performance of the alveolar endothelial barrier, or this is a very old study that we published on introducing the concept of ventilator-induced lung injury and the effect of ventilator-induced lung injury in terms of multiple organ failure, where you can see how ventilator-induced lung injury, the use of a very high tidal volume and very low levels of PEEP was associated with multiple organ failure and the organ that was the target of this mechanism was the kidney. So, uh, as alluded before, we nowadays have renal replacement therapy platform that have been adapted by adding either uh, in, uh, in serious and membrane lung to allow at the same time renal replacement therapy and CO2 removal. And a number of studies have tested the feasibility of this approach. This is one of the first that modify a, a standard renal, homemade modification of a renal replacement therapy, adding a, a, to the, uh, an oxygenator to the uh, dialytic membrane. And you can see that in this study, the authors were able to obtain uh, a reasonable level of blood flow and a reasonable level of CO2 removal, maintaining the efficacy of renal replacement therapy. Because here you have the three variables you have to take into consideration. You must be able to maintain blood flow sufficient for renal replacement therapy and CO2 removal, and maintain an efficient renal support and a decent CO2 removal given the level of blood, the low level of blood flow that you are using. And the study demonstrated that this uh, approach was at least feasible and was able to obtain a, a reasonable improvement of a number of physiological variables. Uh, a second study confirmed this uh, hypothesis and showed that combining renal replacement therapy with CO2 removal was safe, no side effects, and was able to maintain the blood purification in terms of renal support and uh, obtain some level of, of, of lung protection. That was the first study that actually implicated that the efficacy of the system was somehow related where the, on the position of the lung membrane before or after the uh, hemofilter. And the data in this study seemed to show that positioning the membrane oxygenator amps upstream would have improved the efficacy of the renal replacement therapy. With this in mind, a number of years ago, my friend and colleague Vito Fanelli from Turin performed this 
prospective uh, clinical study, multicenter clinical study. So what we was, the, we took a renal replacement therapy device modified by adding a membrane lung, and we uh, saw if it was possible, was feasible to protect the lung using uh, CO2 removal, maintaining the efficacy of renal replacement therapy. And we use as a control group a group of patients with moderate ARDS that was treated with conventional renal replacement therapy. So in the intervention of simulating, a sort of simulating a randomized control trial, in the interventional group, renal replacement therapy was associated with CO2 removal, allowing us to go from a tidal volume of 6 to a tidal volume of 4. In the control group, renal replacement therapy was obtained in the conventional way and mechanical ventilation was set with a tidal volume of 6. We look at the pro-apoptotic signal into, uh, of the patients and we were able to show that using this combined supportive therapy where CO2 removal allowed a super protective strategy maintaining renal replacement therapy, we were able to see a reduction in the pro-inflammatory signals evaluated by the concentration of inflammatory mediator of the circulating pro-inflammatory mediators and the pro-apoptotic signal that was obtained in this setting of uh, in this experimental setting. So this biological benefit, so less inflammation, less apoptosis, combining renal replacement therapy and CO2 removal to allow super protective ventilatory strategy, also translated into a signal of efficacy of the treatment since the creatine reduction observed combining CO2 removal with renal replacement therapy was uh, more enhanced in the patients treated with ECOR plus renal replacement therapy. We were uh, thinking about to, to, to not simulate the randomized control trial, to perform the randomized control trial, but then COVID arrived. And as you know, with COVID was not exactly the first thing that came up in your mind to run a randomized control trial in this context, at least. So this is uh, a paper that we published a few months ago and is a, is a retrospective analysis of the use of this approach in the context of patients with COVID-19. So it's a retrospective review uh, analyzing data from nine Italian hospitals that included patients with COVID-19 associated mild or moderate ARDS on, tide, on vent, mechanical ventilation in home, the use of the 6 ml per kilogram ideal body weight was not able to obtain a safe ventilatory settings. So where despite the use of 6 ml, delta P was higher than 15 centimeter of water. So patients that were theoretically at risk of ventilator induced lung injury despite the 6 ml per kilogram ideal body weight. And this is the strategy that was implemented. Blood flow was set at about 300 ml per minute with a sweep gas set at zero at the beginning and respiratory rate was, uh, uh, renal replacement therapy was initiated. Tidal volume was reduced from six to four. And then when the lowest value of tidal volume was reached, the sweep gas was activated in order to maintain a PCO2 level Clo as close as possible to the one observed on baseline. And PEEP and FIO2 were titrated in order to maintain an oxygen saturation at about 92%. This is the circuit. And as you can see, the uh, CO2 removal oxygenator, as the membrane lung, was placed upstream relatively to the uh, hemofilter that was placed downstream. So the study endpoint were feasibility and safety. The definition of feasibility was to achieve and maintain the target tidal volume of around 4 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight and the plot of pressure equal or lower than actually 25 with the PCO2 that was, did not increase more than 20% compared to baseline. So to obtain a super protective ventilatory settings with the same PCO2. Safety was uh, occurrence of severe adverse events that were classified as mechanical adverse events related to the performance of the device or clinical related adverse events in terms of coagulation or, or, so, or so on. Uh, 
Of course, in terms of feasibility, we always look at the fact that we were able to provide an effective renal replacement therapy despite, regardless of the use of, of CO2 removal. So the study included 27 patients. Uh, ECOR plus renal replacement therapy was initiated about 11 plus or minus nine days after ICU admission and lasted for about four to six days. For death in the 50% of patients and for normalization of the renal function in the remaining 48% of the patients. Here you have the, 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 the baseline uh, clinical characteristics. First of all, the mortality was relatively high in this subset of patients, about 60%. The tidal volume at baseline was in the target of the protective ventilatory strategy, around 6 ml per kg ideal body weight, with a plateau pressure of uh, 28, 30 centimeter of water. Delta P, PCO2 was 68, with a PF ratio of 180, but delta P and ventilatory ratio were uh, respectively around 20 centimeter of water and higher than three. So both were in, in, in somehow consistent with what E1 was presenting you before. So patients that were at high risk of potential ventilator induced leg injury and that could potentially better respond to CO2 removal. This is something that came up looking at his data. These are the results in terms of feasibility. I'm sorry for the error mistake in the spelling here. Uh, we were able to obtain the target tidal volume, the target plateau pressure, and the target reduction in delta P, in, in delta P systematically in all patients. Here you have probably the most important uh, results in terms of feasibility because all this was obtained in patients that manifested at time zero a renal acute renal failure and we were able to treat acute renal failure with the renal replacement therapy device despite the use of CO2 removal during the treatment. And this was obtained with substantially no effect in terms of PCO2 and pH and maintaining a constant PF ratio. Safety, no patient related events, either uh, related to the extracorporeal circuit, so the circuit worked in all cases, and we observed four episodes of premature circuit co uh, clotting that required replacement of the circuit. Now, of course, with the limit uh, associated to the small numbers of patients, we did not observe any uh, patients-related side effect. Should we conclude with this, that this should be used in everybody? And I think we should remain consistent with what was said before. And I use this, uh, the quotation of the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, that said that everything that is uh, ethically uh, accessible and valuable is everything that is a a available for everybody. So since this approach is not available to everybody because we don't have clinical evidence supporting the clinical efficacy of this treatment, this treatment should not be made available to everybody unless the limit of clinical trials or case series. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Marco. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, yes. Just speak loudly. I think it'll save time. Yeah. Can, can you speak at the microphone, please? Sorry, yeah. Um, we've heard relatively compelling evidence, some of the remarkable outcomes that the large volume ECMO centers have achieved in the last few years. Um, and so I guess I'm asking the question of, of the, yourself and, and some of the other contributors is what, what you think the role of this uh, mechanism is in the future with the knowledge of knowing that VV ECMO is better when delivered in large volume centers, because I think originally we felt that maybe this was a more achievable therapy to be delivered 
across the board. So that's what I'm interested to... Now, this on. is uh, a modification of renal replacement therapy. And renal replacement therapy, in theory, should be allowed in any intensive care unit. It has nothing to do with the concept of high volume for ECMO, which I, I substantially, not entirely agree. I substantially agree. Because the high volume concept was developed in an area where ECMO was a nightmare from the technological standpoint. Nowadays, it's easier to put a patient on ECMO than to measure transpulmonary pressure. You see? Nonsense. But... Mm? I mean, at least to, under, uh, to measure and understand transpulmonary pressure. That's probably is more correct. So, but renal replacement therapy is, is, I mean, if we have evidence showing that there is a direct clinical advantage of this approach, I would be much more permissive in my conclusion. The, the reason why I'm resisting is that from the ideological point of view, I don't support the use of anything if I don't have the results of a good, good clinical study showing me an improvement in outcome associated with a safety profile. I don't have this piece of evidence, so I cannot conclude saying use it. But not because of the volume of because that's renal replacement therapy. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. Right up to the end, you were on point there. Oh, um, okay. it's kind of short. Okay, if you can do one more question quickly. I don't know if it works. Yeah. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, uh, I would like to do two considerations, actually a question. Um, the first one is related to when we think about a CO2 removal on a mild to moderate ARDS, we always refer to hypoxemia, so oxygenation problem. But when, in this case, like of CO2 removal, we have a clear limi technical limitation, which is with low flow, medium flow devices, CO2 removal is a limitation. For example, we should consider if a patient, a small patient, has a total CO2 removal of, let's say, 200 milliliters per minute, it's not the same of a big, way bigger patient with 300 milliliters per minute. And in that case, I'm not able to provide the same efficacy of the treatment. I'm not able to reduce the plateau pressure or minute ventilation of the same extent. I think this is uh, quite relevant for, for me. Second thing is that, again, on technical limitations. When we discover that technical limitations is the biggest problem of the te technology, maybe before going on with trials and possibly harming patients, maybe we should go back to from, from bedside to the bench and maybe w wait for a leap in technology before going forward always with the same indications, always with the same technology and insisting on this. Well, it's hard to, to answer this question. <laughs> I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, for the matter of time, the answer is yes. But, you know, I, I think we have, you see, we are gaining data. So it's not uh, too, the, 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 the conclusion we need more data is not the polite way to say, I have no idea what I'm talking about. And, uh, because for the simple reason that I, I believe we have preliminary data. You see the supernova trial, for example, in, in patients with the ARDS, with mild to moderate air, moderate to severe ARDS, we know that with that technology, half a liter is not going to work. We know that. And we know that we have to use higher blood flow. Now you, you should ask, you should not ask me, you should ask the principal investigator of the rest trial, for Christ's sake, why did you do the study with a half a liter when you were one of the author of the study that show that with half a liter blood flow, you don't obtain the target tidal volume, super protective tidal volume. But that's, that's life, you know. You started the trial and then you, you know, it's a matter of luck, it's a matter, I don't know. But I think we have enough data. And the other thing is, what we have to understand is that uh, at, at a conference recently, somebody said, uh, low, God does not make uh, low blood flow all equal. 
So it's not the, the blood flow as it says. For example, in this context, the position of the relative position of oxygenator and hemofilter makes a difference. A small difference, but can be substantial in, given the limited uh, range of blood flow. So I think we have enough data to start to consider clinical trials. I, I, we don't need only randomized control trial. We can do something else, but that's another story. I mean, that's, they are going to kick me out. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. So, yeah. so um, Dr. Gattinoni um, will not be able to make it for his talk, and um, my colleague here, Dr. Luigi Camporada, is going to take over and talk about extracorporeal CO2 removal for oxygenation. Well, thank you very much, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry that uh, you didn't get what you were expecting, but um, we'll try our best. So, essentially, when we, th when we think about oxygenation, uh, oxygenation has been the entry criteria for ECMO trials. You can see from 1979, uh, there were fast entry criteria, slow entry criteria, where there was a PF ratio and some of the FiO2 and PEEP. And you can see CESAR trial, for example, use also the oxygenation, more combined um, um, uh, marker, sort of using the MARI score. Uh, but essentially, PF ratio is one of the criterion within the MARI score. And then clearly, the EOLIA trial used the PF ratio as well. But it was on interesting because the EOLIA trial, not only did he use the PF ratio, but also so the, one of the criteria was the, an arterial pH less than 7.5 with a pHCO2 which was above 60, which is quite important for something that I'm going to say shortly. So you can see this is the EOLIA trial, and what you can see very clearly is that when we start uh, um, ECMO, you can see the ECMO is in red. You can see what happens is the uh, CO2 goes down. Uh, you can see from the baseline to in ECMO initiation, uh, the mean of ventilation goes down quite significantly and therefore the driving pressure. But you can see the oxygenation remains exactly the same. So the ECMO group and the uh, conventionally randomized group have the same uh, oxygenation. So keep that in mind for the time being because we're going to revisit um, uh, in a in few minutes. But if if we contrast the oxygenation with the carbon dioxide, you can see that despite a reduction in mean of ventilation, the carbon dioxide obviously goes down and the pH improves and uh, driving pressure and plateau pressure are decreased. So clearly there is a, um, a very efficient way to reduce the intensity of mechanical ventilation whilst at the same time reducing CO2. Uh, CO2. So the question is, if oxygenation is not related to survival, why use it as an entry criterion? So think about uh, which patient might be suitable for ECHO2R, which one for ECMO. We've seen that is much more than just oxygenation. So this is interesting, again, from the supplementary material of the, of the um, uh, EOLIA trial. And you can see this is really interesting because uh, they've looked not only at the criteria number one, which was a very severe hypoxemia, uh, or the milder hypoxemia, but you can see the relative reduction in um, mortality in this group um, are uh, sort of significantly lower compared to the survival benefit um, of patients with higher carbon dioxide who were randomized to ECMO. So you can see that this, if, if a pH was less than 7.5 or PO2 greater than 60 um, for more than six hours were randomized, and you can see the effect size of ECMO. Um, to, um, uh, in this group of patients. So it's very clear, and I'm not going to spend any time on this because it's been discussed uh, for the previous talks, but essentially we can um, remove carbon dioxide to the level required um, to maintain or control ventilation uh, just with a much lower blood flow compared to ECMO. 
And, um, and if we look at this, uh, um, this graph here, you can see this is a blood flow, uh, um, again on the right and on the left. And you can see that uh, a low blood flow here, this is like extracorporeal CO2 removal level, the amount of oxygen transferred through the membrane is incredibly low. So not just uh, enough for oxygenation, but you have seen that at the same level of CO2, sorry, of blood flow, the CO2 re uh, removal through the membrane lung is still significant to allow reduction in intensity of mechanical ventilation. So we go from bedside now to the laboratory and we look at experimental animals. Uh, you can see uh, this is uh, set up in, uh, in Göttingen. And what you can see is, first of all, uh, what we've done, we just randomize animals uh, to a um, having hydrochloric acid or oleic acid. Now the hydrochloric acid is uh, installation through the trachea, so it causes a direct uh, primary lung ARDS, uh, whereas the oleic acid is injected and it causes a primarily a pulmonary edema, very diffuse uh, lung edema there. So what you can see is the um, PF ratio was achieved, uh, was a moderate to severe um, ARDS, at least on the PF, um, the PF criteria. You can see the plateau pressure there. And you can see there is a lot of water accumulated in the lung, particularly in the oleic acid. Uh, but you can see also, you can start seeing that the wedge pressure, the pul uh, this, this animal's developed pulmonary hypertension. But this is just, if you can follow here one second, you can see this is the time axis on the horizontal side. And what you can see is the total VO2 on the um, uh, Y uh, axis. And you can see ECMO is in, in red and extracorporeal CO2 removal is in blue. Now, what you can see, first of all, that once the animals were randomized and then the gas flow was started, either into um, uh, Ecotua or ECMO, you can see that patients on ECMO had a much quicker reduction in VO2. So they start uh, utilizing less oxygen. They start um, essentially uh, requiring even less oxygen. Whereas you can see in both models that using extracorporeal CO2 removal, the uh, uh, VO2 goes up. So there is a lot more energy and oxygen requirement in this um, subgroup and we'll see that the same thing happens with the VCO2. It's a bit um, what has been discussed this morning. If there is a, a lot of effort, uh, then the, the VCO2 goes up and you can see it's much uh, bigger difference in the uh, echo 2 r now, why is this important? Because when we go into the oxygenation and the carbon dioxide, you can see one thing. Again, I'll remind you that these are animals with um, moderate severe ARDS, either on ECMO in red or an extracorporeal. But what you can see, this is the, the time course of oxygenation. So uh, oxygenation at the beginning, lavage or, the, or, or injury, and then let them recover over time with extracorporeal support. But you can see, when you see PO2 alone, after four to eight hours, the two, the two techniques are exactly the same. Similarly to the Aeolia study where the controls and the ECMO had similar oxygenation. So if there is a um, time lag, between four and eight hours, the, the, CO2, the, sorry, the oxygenation is exactly uh, the same uh, between the two uh, extracorporeal devices. Uh, whereas here, you can see the same thing, sorry, apologies, uh, with the, apologies, uh, I meant to go backwards, but... Um, that's it. Um, you can see here that these, um, uh, the saturation, again, uh, very similar with the hydrochloric acid, which is important, sort of the um, direct injury, whereas where it's more diffuse, it takes much longer to equilibrate and regain oxygenation. But eventually, between four and, uh, and eight hours, the oxygenation and the saturation are the same. Okay, so what are we going to look at uh, the other effects, particularly the hemodynamic effects? Now, what you can see here is that while patients on, sorry, patients, animals uh, on ECMO maintained a very low 
pulmonary vascular resistance, the increase in oxygen requirement, the increase in VCO2, and therefore the increase in PaCO2 uh, um, increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. You can see here in the direct injury and the um, uh, uh, more generalized injury. And this is quite important. You can see here, this is the mean uh, oxygen venous saturation, and this is the pulmonary vascular resistance. You can see that as the, uh, this is on ECMO here, you can see that the pulmonary vascular resistance are very low because the uh, mixed venous oxygenation is high uh, through the ECMO support. Whereas here there is a linear relationship between the oxygenation in the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vascular resistance. So, Okay, although at eight hours the oxygenation was similar, but the hemodynamic effects are important. And this is the, the other one when we look at, um, again, mixed venous, this time carbon dioxide in the mixed venous blood, and then you can see the pulmonary vascular resistance. And as you would expect, through the ECMO, we can maintain carbon dioxide uh, content in the blood uh, uh, stable uh, by removing as much as is required, whereas we are limited in extracorporeal CO2 removal, so the pulmonary vascular resistance uh, goes up. And if we imagine this, what happens uh, with the, um, uh, uh, with the um, 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 increased pulmonary vascular resistance, means hemodynamic uh, derangement, means higher um, catecholamine use. And now what I want to show you here is the effect on the lung per se. So now what, what you can see this paradoxical effect. Now again, look at the ECMO over time. We've seen that although the carbon dioxide was well maintained and the oxygenation was well maintained, the lung continue to deteriorate. So there is a price to pay to ultra-protective ventilation because over time the elastance of, the, of these lungs continues to increase in the uh, ECMO-treated group, whereas in the extracorporeal CO2 removal, because we were not aiming at ultra-protective, we couldn't afford ultra-protective ventilation, uh, the lung maintained a certain elastance. So that's quite, that's quite important. And so this is my last slide, because it's a complicated design, and the question is, when do we choose ECMO, when do we choose extracorporeal CO2 so removal? And I think this is a little summary slide and this last slide. So obviously there are three components that we need to think about. We need to think about the model. Uh, in our patient population, we might want to think about pulmonary versus extrapulmonary RDS, for example. So imagine um, hydrochloric acid being a pneumonia, a direct pulmonary injury. We need to think about, in this particular case, sometimes it's more, less severe hypoxemia, so it's very heterogeneous disease, uh, which will allow some blood to be shunted in areas of normal lungs, so compensating on some of the oxygenation. We've got low extravascular lung water and high hypoxic vasoconstriction. Whereas in this model, which is the pulmonary edema, more diffuse, uh, is clearly there is uh, more severe hypoxemia. There is no way of compensating uh, for directing blood into area of the normal lung because the lung is uniformly deranged. And again, there is greater extravascular lung water. But look at the effect of ECMO versus ECOTOR. Clearly, there is an increase in oxygenation in ECMO. That's what uh, uh, stands for, extra CO2 o membrane oxygenation. Uh, but also, we have uh, a profound effect on hemodynamics, much more protective hemodynamics. And we've got the opportunity to reduce the VO2 and the VCO2 of the patient, things that which is not possible in the ecotour. So although we maintain the same oxygenation potentially, the price that we need to pay seems to be mainly hemodynamic. And again, there is an effect on the ultra-protective, and we need to define and agree on what ultra-protective actually means, but there is a side effect of the potential uh, uh, deterioration of lung elastance over time through a progressive de-recruitment and um, worsening of lung function. So I think that's all I was going to say, and uh, thank you very much for listening, and um, thank you also on behalf of Professor Gattinoni.